Raphael Bostic is the Bedrosian Professor uh, and Director of the Center and Bedrosian Center for Governance and the Public Enterprise here at the Saul Price School. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from Harvard University and a PhD in economics from Stanford. Uh, his work spans home ownership, housing finance, and urban change, and the role of institutions in shaping policy effectiveness. Uh, most recently, Raphael served three years in Washington as uh, the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. That's a presidential appointment. The president has to appoint you. The Senate has to ratify the appointment. Congratulations on both of those things. <laughs> At this point in time, it's, it seems like even more of an impressive accomplishment. <laughs> At the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Raphael led an interdisciplinary team of 150 persons uh, with expertise in all policy areas of importance to the department, housing, housing finance, rental assistance, community development, economic development, sustainability, homelessness, et cetera. Um, and what I asked Raphael to do is to speak to us really in many ways simply about his experience with policy making uh, from that federal level. And uh, that's what he's prepared to do. So let me introduce Professor Raphael Boston. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I figured I'd try to take his lead. Um, it's good to see you all. Uh, thank you, Marlon, for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk uh, to you about uh, my Washington experience. Um, as I was thinking, I was as I, well, I decided I was going to present on one thing. And then I looked at the title and thought, well, this is an urban growth seminar series, and I'm not actually going to talk about urban growth specifically. Um, so we may have time at the end, and I'm happy to talk about all the things that we do at HUD around helping urban places grow. So we have grant programs, we have subsidies, we think about economic development, fair housing, equal access to opportunity, all those sorts of things. I'm happy to talk about that as much as possible. But what I thought I would do is follow the instructions that I was given. Uh, Marlon asked me to talk about um, my experiences in Washington and really give a flavor for, uh, for uh, how it is, um, how it could be, uh, and then why it is the way that it is. And um, perhaps the biggest uh, lesson that I got from uh, the time in Washington was um, it is how it is for, for good reasons. Uh, and part of what we need to think about in the academy is uh, are all those reasons reasons that we really need to have? Are there changes that we can do to get more effective policy? Uh, and uh, how can we think about uh, the structures and the rules of the game um, and changing them in ways to allow things to happen more effectively? Um, so Marlon talked about my background. It's in economics, housing, finance, all those sorts of things. Uh, my job here is in governance, which is not any of those things. Um, but it, it really, um, my, my interest in this space has really emerged from my experience. So I wanted to talk a bit about that, give you some perspective on those things. Um, and Marlon talked about being confirmed. Um, it is, uh, that is a, something that not everybody has to do. It's something that perhaps most people should not want to do. Um, and I will say that um, I've been gone from HUD from about, for about 16 months now. And I don't, the, my successor has not been confirmed yet. So, um, so this is part of the structure that we have to think about in terms of continuity of government and making sure that policies uh, don't just stagnate and get stuck uh, when transition happens. And our system transition is going to happen on a regular basis. All right. Um, so what I wanted to do in terms of setting this up is really uh, do four things. One, give you some background to, to provide a context for the, uh, the environment that I stepped into when I got to Washington. Um, then I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, what we did and why we did those things and not other things. Um, I tell my undergrads all the time, um, the, the, ro the world is the way it is for good reasons and that all the easy problems have been solved. Right? And so, uh, so when we don't have easy problems left, the hard ones necessarily require compromise. 
and typically second and third and fourth best solutions. So I wanted to give you a flavor for, for the constraints that we had in terms of thinking about policy uh, so that you can um, maybe look at the world a bit differently. And then I want to talk about uh, some of the lessons that have been learned, um, some perspectives that I have uh, gained uh, a, a deeper appreciation for the policy making space. Uh, some of them are institutional, some of them are personal relational, some of them are based on the market and so I wanted to talk a bit about all of those things. Uh, and then I wanted to uh, hopefully leave some time at the end for questions. Um, Marlon says we have till 1.30. Um, I don't have to be anywhere till 3 so uh, <laughs> that should give us plenty of time to cover the things uh, that, that we would need to. All right, um, in terms of the background and the things that we did, I'm going to focus on uh, the big picture stuff, like the, the high profile types of activities that you all should be familiar with. Um, I'm not going to talk about a lot of other things, uh, and in some ways those other things might ultimately be more uh, enduring and impactful, uh, but um, they were under the radar screen and um, so in some instances it's better to keep them there. Uh, so, uh, so we can talk about those things as well. You know, I ran an organization of 150 people um, that was really supposed to be the think tank for the department. And as such, we touched on a lot of policies and got pulled into a lot of policy debates and discussions in the building uh, that uh, I, I'm proud to say we helped resolve. And so those things have created legacies and, and uh, patterns for policy that I think are going to ultimately uh, change the trajectory of some really important things and, and that's good. All right, so I'm going to do the background, so let me start there. Um, oh, I've got to turn this thing on. That helps. All right, so I just talked about all those things. Um, and now I want to talk about the background. All right, so um, I started in July of 2009. I was announced to be confirmed in January of 2009. And uh, for those of you who are market watchers, um, this was not the best time to be put in a place to talk to look at, how, at economic policy. Right? What we had in October of 2008 was perhaps one of the most uh, striking uh, economic uh, disruptions that you're going to have, uh, hopefully the most striking economic disruption you'll have in your lifetime. Uh, we saw a tremendous decline uh, and contraction of the economy. Uh, this is in the context of jobs. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense, I've shown for 20, 20 some odd years, we had three other recessions during this period. Uh, and you can see that nothing was approaching what we have uh, in this context. Uh, this is true also in terms of just uh, broad economic output. This is a measure of GDP. Uh, you can see that um, um, even do, through some of the, the earlier recessions, we did not see significant contracts in GDP. There was a recession that happened around in here. Um, and you'll see contraction, the economy ground to something close to a halt, but it didn't stop and it certainly didn't go in the other direction. This was something qualitatively different. Uh, unemployment, uh, which had been in the four and a half to five range, started moving up. It would not stop moving up till we got to ab above 10%. Uh, so these are um, really uh, qualitatively different experiences uh, moving forward. And the thing that was most interesting, uh, interesting is probably not a well-chosen word, but, but uh, unusual about this experience was that it was driven by real estate and housing. Right? So real estate and housing are typically trailing indicators. They follow where the economy goes. Uh, in this instance, they drag the economy where it was going. So you all know that there, is a, there was this increase in house prices that, followed, that started through the 2000s, um, actually the increase in house price had been a long-term trend. Uh, the change in the pace of increase uh, change was significant starting in the 2000s. Uh, and it culminated in 2006, the summer. Uh, that's where it peaked out and then things started going in the other direction. And uh, when it started going, it kind of got everyone's attention. Um, this uh, drove the collapse of a number of uh, significant uh, financial institutions. Think about Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. 
Uh, those uh, contractions and collapses led to ripples through the entire economy uh, that basically brought the economy to its knees. Uh, and uh, when I got in, they had passed uh, the TARP bill. So TARP was a large uh, bailout type of, uh, of piece of legislation designed to prop up uh, institutions across our financial system to prevent us from moving to a barter economy effectively. All right, and so, so TARP was important and it was a really good thing to do even though it was not sold that way. And we can talk about those issues uh, at the end if you wish. All right, and um, for us, what, what was perhaps one of the, the, the also very significant things was its decline in home ownership, right? So if you think about US policy, we have had a um, uh, it, policy pertaining to housing, and it really focused on home ownership as the goal. Right, so every president from at least Herbert Hoover across both uh, parties had been trying to, had, had declared as their housing policy um, the goal of increased home ownership. And so if you look at home ownership rates, they had been going straight up for many, many years. And our system is really uh, embedded with a bunch of incentives to try to, to make that happen. Um, started turning the other way, and we had to figure out what to do. So then the question is, what, what would you do? Um, and the answer is that uh, is a lot of things, right? And if you look at this, uh, this, this difficulty, um, the response to the, the crisis uh, touched on every part of the financial system. It, it involved uh, uh, bolstering institutions. It involved reaching out to home buyers and homeowners, regular Americans. It dealt with neighborhoods in trying to uh, keep them stabilized in the, in the midst of uh, significant uh, uh, contractions and concentrations of foreclosures. Um, and it dealt with, uh, with, uh, with states and companies and, people and workers who are trying to keep it together through this, uh, this difficulty. Now people talk about the response to the housing crisis. Most people don't talk about it in this diverse way. And um, we, we actually crafted something called the housing scorecard. If you haven't looked at it, you should go look at it. It's, it's a nice uh, measure of, of, of what we have done and, and how the market is proceeding over time. Um, it took us a long time to get that scorecard public uh, because, well, I'll get to that later on. Uh, but but uh, I think people don't appreciate two things. One, how deep the crisis was uh, and how broad spread, widespread it was. And then second, how broad and comprehensive the response to it was. And um, you know, one of the things I said a lot in, in my press conferences and dealing with the media was, there's no such thing as a single silver bullet in this space, right? And the expectations that were set up, um, some by the administration, uh, some by the public, uh, kind of gave an impression that you know, we could, in a quick little swoop, fix all this and get it all straightened out. And um, that created difficulties for us, and ultimately it wasn't true. All right, so what I wanted to do is just focus on two examples um, I was going to focus on three, but I ran out of time in making slides, so, um, so I'm not going to do the third one. Uh, the third one was going to be the Emergency Homeowners Loan Program, which we called ELP. Uh, and um, that has uh, it's a really interesting tale of, of dysfunction on some level. Uh, and that dysfunction really uh, hampered the program's effectiveness. Uh, but I wanted to talk about HAMP and HARP. Uh, these are our two uh, probably most visible and most well-known, widely known uh, programs. So how many people have heard of HAMP and HARP? HAMP and or HARP? You weren't listening to your radio ads and, <laughs> and all this. So, so um, part, part of uh, the issue that we have in all these policies is take up, right? And uh, the goal for, for us was to try to get as many people to use these things as possible because um, that's really how you would prevent uh, the, the diffusion of the distress into other places and into other parts of the marketplace. So you want to do that. But let me talk a bit about HAMP and HARP. All right, so HAMP, the basics. So HAMP is a mortgage refinance 
program um, that is designed to try to help homeowners get into a mortgage and get into a payment stream uh, that is more sustainable and manageable. So when at the very beginning of this crisis, uh, what happened, a lot of the difficulties arose because people were trying to get into home ownership basically at any cost. And they took and used uh, products that had uh, very uh, idiosyncratic uh, payment streams. The payment streams were such that they were very low for the first two to three years. Uh, and then they popped up their, uh, these adjustable rate type products such that your monthly payments could increase anywhere from $200 to $1,800 a month, right? somewhere in that space. So if you get to the, to the time when it bumps up, all of a sudden you are in trouble. Because right? you don't usually have an extra $1,600 sitting around to pay for housing. So, um, so the HAMP program was really designed to help people who got in trouble because of that get into a different type of mortgage product. You know, one that had a, a more stable payment that got them back down into the 30% of your monthly income rather than the 50% of your monthly income. All right. Um, you had to demonstrate a bunch of conditions, uh, and it was voluntary. So HAMP is a volunteer program. Lenders did not have to participate in it if they didn't want to. And this became an important issue uh, moving forward in terms of implementing. Um, all right. So I got in. The HAMP started in April um, and soon was declared a failure. Um, and uh, many of my hours were spent uh, responding to why is HAMP such a failure? Why is it terrible? Uh, what doesn't it do? Now, the reason it was, you know, if you ask me, the reason it was declared a failure is because in the opening press conference when they talked about um, this program, um, they declared that the program would touch somewhere between three and four million households, three to four million Americans. Um, to date, you know, this was 2009, this was 2013, I think they've just passed one million. Uh, and so that benchmark became something, you know, people started saying, if there's going to be a three-year program, if we're going to get to three million, you need to be having you know, a lot of people every month, right, about 80,000, 90,000 a month. And you know, four months in, we were at you know, 40,000 when we needed to be at 320,000. Um, so you invited a lot of questions and difficult conversations that we had to have and many pre-meetings before press conferences. What are you going to say? How are we going to explain this? Um, it turned out that HAMP was a difficult program for a couple of reasons. One, because the government wasn't running it, it relied on, the insti inst on institutions other than the federal government to put in place systems and to execute it in ways uh, that we wanted them to. Right? So the way HAMP runs is basically through servicers. So when you get a mortgage, you deal with a lender. The lender doesn't deal with the monthly payment stuff. You send your checks in. You send it to a, a company, which is called a servicer. And that servicer is the organization that has the personal relationship with you. Um, if we're going to modify mortgages, we've got to get the servicers to first identify who's in trouble and then have a, a mechanism or a process whereby they can then connect up with the lender, they can be in, there can be a negotiation on how to change the mortgage, and then we change the mortgage. All right. We had never done anything like this before. Right? And our industry was not in the habit of modifying mortgages once they originated. Uh, either we were going to foreclose on you, or we were going to have you sell the house and get a different product, right? so, or your refi. Refi only works if house prices are going up. Uh, when they're going down, we can't refi anymore. So the HAMP program was actually trying to create a new industry, right? a modification industry. And we had no idea uh, how long it was going to take to do that. And we had very little appreciation about how hard it was going to be to do. So, um, so HAMP, for the first eight to 10 months, very little happened. It took very long time for the servicers to get their act together. Um, we had many. Uh, calling all the services, why is it taking so long, conversations. But at the end of the day, a voluntary program by private organizations to do something the government wants to do where there's potential for loss on the private side isn't something that they're going to sort of rush through. Right? So, so the, the HAMP process and, and how it was positioned was quite difficult. If you look at what happened, um, I think two things happened that were significant. One, 
a lot of people actually did use hemp, right? So a million households is a million more than zero, right? And in the context of a housing crisis that is going across the entire country, if we can get a million people into a more stable payment stream, that's a very good thing. But what was also not appreciated was the fact that, um, that we, as the federal government, showed the industry that modifications can work. Right? And so uh, the private institutions f started doing it themselves. And so HOPE, HOPE now is a consortium of banks. Uh, and that's a process whereby the banks themselves did their own modifications. And you'll notice that the HOPE now numbers are much higher than the HAMP numbers. Um, and so you could make a case that HAMP actually has led to more than three million people touched. Now, we didn't mess with it that way. Uh, we created a lot of our own problems. I was not there when the, at the three million uh, uh, household press conference. Uh, but we really didn't do a very good job about making clear what impact was going to be and what the possible impact channels were likely to be. Uh, and that has uh, created difficulties to this day. So uh, in the HAMP uh, lines up here, you'll see that there are trial modifications and permanent mods. So the trial mod was, uh, the, the, one of the things that we were trying to do is get change happening fast. Right? So in order to be, to be eligible for HAMP, you had to demonstrate income and all this kind of stuff. Um, but we didn't want to wait for you to get all the documentation and have it all verified and all that stuff. So we would allow you to go into a trial mod and then later, it, once everything was verified, it would be converted into a permanent mod. All right, what we find is that there's about a 50 to 60% fallout rate. So of, the, of those who go into trial, there's something that doesn't really work in terms of their, their details. Um, and that's another thing that has not been discussed very well. So the expectation was everyone who goes into a, perm a trial will eventually be a permanent. Uh, and we didn't really say that that's not likely to happen. Right, so, so how you talk about these, pro these programs, understanding the range of possible impacts, and then um, do, understanding it internally, and then communicating externally is critical. Right? Setting expectations is most of the game. I, I think about, um, I'm a Trekkie, I'm a Star Trek fan, and um, uh, my, one of my favorite things in Star Trek uh, is uh, Scotty, the, the chief engineer, never said, yeah, we can do it, right? He always said, We're, this is impossible. You're pushing us to, to levels we can't accomplish. And then he always got it done, right? <laughs> Setting the expectations uh, changed how he was perceived in his job. Uh, so you definitely want to make sure that as you uh, talk about the things you can do, uh, try to, to promise things you can deliver, and then deliver beyond what you promise. All right, so that's, um, that's hemp. The, the other thing I want to talk, the next one I want to talk about is HARP. And HARP is the Home Affordable uh, Refinance Program. And this is a program which was designed to help homeowners that were potentially underwater refinance into uh, lower interest rate uh, products. So through the course of this crisis, the, uh, as we got into the recession, the Federal Reserve dropped interest rates. Significantly, they're basically at zero now. Uh, when those interest rates fall, uh, that means the interest rates for everything else falls. So now if you get a mortgage, your interest rate would go from a 6% to a 3%. Uh, that gives you a lot of extra cash, right? Um, but you're only going to do those refinances. A lender's only going to do those refinances if they believe that the house is worth at least as much as the loan is. And in this, in, in this environment where house prices are falling significantly, uh, fewer and fewer homes actually had values that were more than the mortgages that they were trying to get. And so banks weren't doing it, even though in the context of this recession, uh, a refinance could save you $400 or $500 a month. Right? And in the context of a deep recession, $400 is a lot of money. Well, $400 is a lot of money, period. Uh, but especially in this environment, when we're, uh, when we're concerned about households not engaging in the marketplace, giving them some extra disposable income was important. So there were a bunch of rules around, uh, around uh, HARP, um, but it didn't really work very well. Right? Lenders were extremely reluctant to do this. Um, they put on extra conditions on top of the program uh, terms here. And we didn't really see very much. And the other thing is that there were lots of fees that were associated. You had to get a 
particular appraisal, you had processing fees, all these sorts of issues. Uh, it made it kind of a hassle for the homeowner to do it. Uh, and they were already distressed, so they didn't want to engage in any more. So we did something called HARP 2.0, uh, which, which lifted all uh, loan to value caps. So anyone who's underwater was now eligible. Um, it broadened, it removed all the fees. Um, it eliminated liabilities that lenders might have for doing this. And um, it worked really well. So in the first uh, three months of, of HARP 2.0, we had as, as many um, mortgages that were refied as we had in the first several years of HARP 1.0. Right, so changing the program uh, was uh, effective. Uh, it was hard. Right, so the problems in HARP were well known uh, very soon after the program began. Getting all of the institutions, um, again, this is another one where you need uh, banks to do things for you. You need servicers to participate. You need Fannie and Freddie and their regulators to agree to all of these things. Um, it was extremely difficult. Um, and it is, it's very interesting. To get, you get into these negotiations, and you see all of those particular and different um, private or institutional interests arise and trying to find that sweet spot in the middle in the midst of a crisis uh, is hard. So a lot of stress, a lot of tension, but ultimately um, it worked extremely well. So you can see the volumes that were going on in HARP 1.0 uh, as compared to where we are in 2.0. Uh, very, very different uh, character to them. Um, so we were all very pleased with this. I had a bunch of PSAs that I did. It was pretty neat. All right. Um, and so what, what happened um, is that we have seen the housing market stabilize and start to recover. All right, so when we got there, um, the prices were pretty much in free fall, um, and they're not anymore. And I think a lot of it has to do with the infusion of capital, the establishment of a set of programs to reduce distress, and uh, a, real, a real commitment to bolstering this market to try to arrest uh, distress in housing because distress in housing will equal um, distress in the broader marketplace is what, what we've seen. All right. Um, and these are, are um, two pictures. I actually just do this to show you that California, where we are um, much more extreme, much more volatile, um, these two pictures are on the same axis. So the slope actually tells you the story. Right? That's California. That's the nation. All right, so the nation, the, the story is largely the same with stabilization. California is a much bigger deal. Uh, we had a steeper ride up and a tougher ride down. All right, all right. So, so those were some of the things that we did. I could talk about a lot of the other things. I didn't want to do too much on that, but what I wanted to talk a little bit about were some of the constraints, uh, because these constraints are important for policy making, uh, and they arise in many different contexts, and so. It would be um, good to maybe point out some of these things. So the first constraint is really around institutional capacity and structure. And here I want to talk about three different types of capacity constraints. One is just general expertise. Right? So in this instance, when we think about housing policy, because housing had been a trailing indicator, it wasn't uh, a field where there was a lot of internal expertise at the federal government level as to how these institutions work, how the markets work. And so getting people up to speed with that just so that they can understand what is going on before we even try to solve it uh, was a major task. So that's one. So do we have subject matter experts who, uh, who actually know enough so we can make decisions quickly? A second uh, uh, constraint on an institutional level has to do with um, the abilities and the willingness of your partner institutions to do things. So when we think about HAMP, um, HAMP required servicers and required banks who were fully independent and not bound by anything that the federal government wanted to have happen. And so we actually had to set up an incentive structure to get them to do the things that we thought were basically in their interest. Right? But if they did not believe that in, in the long run, then we had to convince them of that in the short run. That, again, takes time. It makes it very difficult to do things extremely quickly in an institutional uh, context. The third one um, is it's about internal institutions themselves. Right, so I didn't talk about the uh, ELP program, uh, but let's suffice it to say 
it required things of HUD that were extremely difficult for HUD to deliver upon in terms of um, systems, in terms of staff expertise, and in terms of uh, internal organizational commitment to delivering on the product that we needed to do. So uh, you can have constraints within an institution, across institutions, and systemically. And all of those uh, were things that we had difficulties with. A second type of constraint is, is really around the diversity of ob objectives and views. So when I talk about uh, my experience, people usually, and they, I tell people it's hard, usually they think I'm going to then move into a diatribe about the Republican Congress who didn't do the things that I want them to do and all these sorts of things. Um, I actually didn't have a lot of problems with the Congress. I'm not saying that they weren't problems. Uh, <laughs> but, but we had many, many more difficulties uh, reaching a consensus internal to the administration. Uh, there were very, very different objectives and perspectives uh, within HUD versus the broader government, uh, within HUD versus the White House, and even within the White House, we might agree with some parts of the White House, but not others. Communications was important. The political folks were important. Um, the broader economic people were important. And the domestic policy people were important. And each of them had a different set of objectives and perspectives. And so in terms of deciding what to do, um, you have to wind up convincing everyone. Right? And the, the arguments that you would use to convince one set may be different and perhaps even conflicting with the arguments you might use to convince someone else. And so managing and navigating that is extremely difficult. Um, and it will lead you to have to make compromises in your programs um, that you ordinarily might not want to do, that you may believe are counter to effectiveness. But if you need to get something done, um, something is better than nothing. So you make the compromise and move on from there. Third is. Um, uh, an issue of moral hazard. So no two words bothered me more in my time at, at, in Washington than the words moral hazard. Um, now everyone here knows what moral hazard is. Um, the challenge that we had in designing our programs was we had a bunch of people who were in trouble and we needed to do something. Some people got in trouble because they were taking a bet and a risk and understood the risk and some people got in trouble because they didn't understand the risk. Right? And as the government, we wanted to try to help as many in the second category and as few in the first category as possible. Um, and so in designing these programs, we wanted to make as much, we make them as narrowly con constructed as possible to try to identify those who took risks uh, and knew it so that they were not beneficiaries. We wanted to provide families uh, minimize the, the, the potential for moral hazard in the broader system. The difficulty is, in many instances, two, ob two observationally equivalent people could be in each of the camps. One could be in each of those camps. And so we went through a bunch of gymnastics uh, to try to carve out conditions and rules to get people to uh, self-identify as either being in the risk taker category or in the, the subject to the market category. Um, and that became very difficult. And so we spent a lot of time, a lot of time, uh, working to try to minimize moral hazard. Uh, and that means that time spent doing that is time not actually doing stuff. Right? And so there was a lot of complaint, m m much complaint from our, our uh, Democratic uh, partners on the Hill, uh, that this administration was just sitting around and talking and not doing enough while families are losing their homes and having a difficult time. Right? The economists, now I'm an economist, um, it's a difficult position for me, uh, were saying, well, if you start just doing anything willy-nilly, you are going to unleash all this moral hazard in the marketplace. People will take excessive risk taking everywhere, and we will, in the long run, be much worse off. All right, so balancing those tensions um, was one of the hardest things that we had to do. Um, ultimately, I was in favor of erring on the side of action. So I uh, did a lot of public speaking. I went around and got yelled at by people on a regular basis. Um, and um, I felt that it was um, 
more important to, to acknowledge people's pain and difficulty and be out there with them. Uh, we can manage them while has it later. I lost most of the time, um, but um, that's the way it goes sometimes. All right, the third, uh, the fourth um, constraint is about the scale of intervention. I talked at the beginning about how big uh, a challenge um, we were facing from an economics perspective. Um, big challenges require big responses. Um, but big responses are likely to attract attention and opposition and concern from those who have other priorities and interests. Right? So when we were trying to, to craft a large response, um, that led to a bunch of complications. Uh, that ultimately um, we had to face. And so in almost all of these programs, uh, the scales were smaller than they might have otherwise been. Um, the scopes may have been restricted or constricted uh, because we needed to build political um, uh, coalitions that would support these programs uh, and support these efforts. And that, again, was also a very difficult thing. So you know, because we're in a system where you know, our founding fathers didn't really want bold things to happen as a practical matter, that, you know, we had seen that with the king, and we didn't want to have that, that go on anymore, um, trying to build consensus to do bold things is extremely difficult. It takes a lot of time, and, um, and that was a lot of work that we, that we did. All right. So those were some of the important constraints um, in, in our system. I wanted to just close by talking about uh, a number of lessons. I think I have seven or eight of them. I was trying to keep this short. Um, I failed. Um, so, um, so key takeaways. Um, the first is about implementation. So I'm an economist, and we spend most of our time talking about incentives and trying to figure out What's the right set of incentives that you need in order to uh, get people to do the things we want them to do? Um, and what typically we do is we, once we figure it out, we say, OK, that's done. Let's move on to the next problem. We never ask the question, can anyone design something to where those, those incentives actually get played out in the marketplace, in the real world? It turns out that's a huge issue, <laughs> right? And, and it's an issue. That, um, that I think we could use a whole lot more guidance on as policymakers. Um, there wasn't a lot of expertise, and there really wasn't a lot of thought that went on in the conversation we had explicitly about what are the, the seven elements we need to implement this policy. Maybe who's in the room, who should be involved, but, but really doing a, a deeper dive in terms of process and implementation uh, is much, much needed. And I think it's something that we uh, here in uh, academia can, can really help with. Um, and the only other thing I would say, well, maybe not the only, uh, but another thing I would say on this is it needs to be simple. It needs to be accessible. It needs to be easily, easily digested. Right? So 200 page uh, documents that lay out all the nuances is not going to get anyone to do them. Right? We need simple checklists that can do those. All right, the second thing I've talked about um, uh, a lot already, which is this notion of expectations. So um, the president had a very difficult task uh, upon being elected in that he represented the hopes and dreams of so many people on so many levels that the expectations were extremely high and almost impossible for him to meet. Perhaps impossible, maybe no almost in there. Right? So that was difficult. Uh, but then there are a bunch of things that came afterwards where there were choices and decisions to make about how to establish those, those expectations. And in some instances, we, we didn't do so good on that. Still set them too high and left ourselves uh, open and vulnerable to attacks um, that you know, in many instances weren't warranted, but they were available because of how we approached it. So thinking about how you set those expectations is something that's particularly critical. Um, the perspective issue, the, the, we wrestled a lot with the White House. The White House had a broader range of, of considerations. Um, they were thinking much more about um, consistency of messaging, consistency of, um, of philosophy across institutions, uh, across the different agencies, um, even when some of those consistencies led to, meant that our policies weren't going to be less effective or more difficult. 
Right? And so we wrestled with them. Uh, in many instances, we actually disagreed with the, cons with the notions that we were exposing the administration to risks that uh, were going to be problematic. Um, but they saw things that we didn't see. And they were afraid of things that we weren't afraid of, and vice versa. And that led to uh, a set of programs that we wanted to do that didn't really happen, um, or that happened under the radar screen. So the, you know, under the radar is oftentimes a bad thing if you're trying to pop yourself up. But in a lot of ways, it's a much better thing. You know, just do what you do on a regular basis. Nobody notices. And you can have sort of broad systemic institutional change uh, that just happens and just keeps going. And so uh, we've done a number of those things, which I'm not going to talk about, because <laughs> I'm on film, and this will be posted somewhere. All right. Um, the fourth point uh, goes with the fifth. Um, uh, they're related. So I don't think I had a very deep appreciation for how large um, the executive branch is, and in particular, the White House. So um, since World War, since the, I think since the Depression, uh, every president successively has moved more and more of decision making into the White House explicitly. And it was surprising um, that uh, we had, um, we answered to uh, a bunch of nameless, faceless people. These are people who you don't know, uh, who walk into the White House every day and are gatekeepers to pretty senior people, including cabinet secretaries. Right? So my secretary couldn't pick up the phone and call the president on a daily basis. He would pick up the phone and call someone in the White House who would then say, you know, you can meet with the president here. Are you you're not going to meet with the president, which is more, more likely what happened. Right? And so, so when that happens, when you pull the decision making and the power into the White House, um, you pull it further away from those who actually work deeply in these subject matter areas. The White House is overseeing a large government. Right? We're trying to touch on a lot of issues. And the staff size is not unlimited. Right? And so we wind up with a situation where there's a, there's a a subject matter expert role that we have to play, or that we had to play. Uh, and I would say this is not limited to the Obama administration. This is true. Uh, this has been an ongoing trend. Uh, you know, the Bush administration did the same thing. And you, know, you think about all the special panels, National Economic Council, the uh, Domestic Policy Council, um, National Security Council, all uh, the Council for Eco Environmental Quality. All of these things are in the White House. Right? And they do not answer to the administration's um, visible representatives on those areas. They answer to the people in the White House. Right? And, uh, and so we need to think about uh, what that means. To me, it wouldn't bother me if we got rid of all those people right? and, and, and created the cabinet and allowed the cabinet institutions to be what they were originally, which is the locus of decision making for these issues. Uh, and have a cabinet secretary really have access, I think that'd be a good thing. Um, that relates to the fifth issue, which, which is around gatekeepers. Um, there are a lot of people who can stop things from happening. Right? Uh, you have a ton of people in the White House. You have a ton of people in my agency who can do that. You have, I haven't mentioned the Hill, but there are a ton of people on the Hill. Um, staffers who work for people on the Hill can stop things. Um, and that's before we even get to the advocacy and interest groups. Right? I haven't talked about lobbyists. I haven't talked about any of those people. There are lots of people around to say no. Right? And our system is really structured uh, where no is the default answer uh, and getting things to happen. Even when there's fairly large consensus around them can be difficult. You can think about um, the, the, the um, uh, gun control issue. Right, where there's a large consensus, but there are, key, there are gatekeepers in key locations that are going to prevent things from happening. Right, and until you can move those people, until you can influence those gatekeepers, um, it's unlikely that anything's going to happen. And I think that's where we are. Um, leadership is extremely important. Um, and I, I, it, it, it surprises me that I put this on a slide um, in the sense that uh, you know, I think about what we do here in the public policy school and contrast it with what happens in the business school across the way there. All right, the business school talks a lot about leadership, a lot about organizations, a lot about processes and controls and all those sort of things. And we talk about bringing people together, inputs and communication and making sure that we have everyone's viewpoint and perspective before uh, drawing a conclusion. That's a gross simplification, I understand. 
But, um, but when I got to, to HUD, it was really striking um, how important leadership is. And when you have large organizations uh, that you're trying to, to get to do things, and do them oftentimes in different ways than they've done it before, you've got to spend a lot of time and effort in two things. One, articulating what that direction is. So making sure that everyone understands what direction you're going to go to, why you're going to go there, and importantly, that you all have a stake in it. Right, so this, is what, this, this direction is important for you and for the institution and for the country. There's a second part of leadership which happens at a much more micro level. Um, and you know, I think about it as controlling the environment. Um, and this really happens on a moment to moment basis in meetings. So how do you run a meeting? How do you make sure that it goes the direction you want it to go? Um, sending messages about what quality is so how do you reject documents that come to you in ways that they don't come back a mess again? Um, in terms of attention and notice to making sure that people know that when they're doing things you're noticing on both the good and the bad. I mean, these are things that are critical and are really important and that very few people actually do. Uh, and so if you can do those things, you can move institutions and have them uh, be effective in ways that others couldn't imagine and couldn't get done. So that's really important. So, so thinking about how we do that, how you carry yourself is really important. Um, the policy occurs at all levels. Um, policy can really arise from anyone and from any place. And uh, the reason I put this up here is that you know, if you look at the set of policies that, uh, that have come out in the last four or five years, um, the, the initial ideas have originated in a range of different locuses from, from different individuals, from different organizations, some on the Hill, some in agencies, some outside. Um, and this is a reminder for me, and I think it should be a reminder for you, is that we should not presuppose uh, where the good ideas are going to come from and which ideas are going to really uh, gain, gain traction and currency. Uh, we have to keep our eyes open. One thing I will say on this, is, which is also quite important, the transition from idea to legislation is hard. Right? Legislation, if you've ever read a piece of legislation, uh, you will see the language is very precise. Um, the types of, and some may say arcane, um, the, the types of things that uh, have to be considered are extremely detailed. And legislation is, is the law, right? So you have to think about all these contingencies that, that you know, the, the basic average idea will not think about. So you spend a lot of time on the fringes of the issue uh, to make sure that you tie it all in, in a nice, neat bow. And that's really important. And then the last thing I would say is uh, on these lessons, the personal relationships are critical. Um, we are a social being, uh, and politics is about uh, a collective decision making, right? So collective means we actually have to talk to the rest of us in the collection, in the collective, uh, and we have to understand them and be willing to listen and listen to them and hear them in a deep way. Um, this helps to massage a number of things. So for me. Um, I had pretty good relationships with everybody, so they let me do what I wanted to do, right? uh, which was nice. Uh, and when, uh, when something was bad was going to happen, I would just say, look, this is going to happen. It's going to be bad. This is why it happened. You know, we're going to have to ride it out. Um, if people ask me, uh, particularly people on the Hill would ask questions that were bad news questions, questions you know, were going to make you look bad, you just have to say, this is how it is. Uh, and that builds credibility that will help you down the road. Right? So short run difficulty can lead to long run uh, success uh, in establishing uh, who you are and what you represent when you say the things that you say. Um, so, so those are things. I, when you think about Washington today, um, the relationship part, this may be our most serious problem, challenge. Right? So we have issues in leadership mm, institutionally and broadly. But the, it doesn't really feel like these people know each other, our, our, our decision makers and our leaders uh, in Washington. Um, they don't get together very often, except in these um, hyper crisis situations. And those aren't the environments where you're actually going to uh, be able to build trust and, and comfort with someone. Right? This is high pressure, high stress. 
uh, crisis, you just want it to be over. Right? And that's not a personal relationship uh, building time. And I think we need to think, how are we going to create those opportunities for people to know each other so that they can actually um, have hard conversations and be willing to give some because they know people well enough to know um, that um, they're not going to get screwed over. All right, so um, I wanted to close with two things. Um, we did take the first quote to heart, uh, and we tried to do big things, um, both uh, broadly to the marketplace, but also within our institutions. Uh, and then the last quote is a quote that um, I, I heard uh, from Bill Clinton. He was here in September, right after I got back. And um, it, it reminded me of something that I said all the time to my staff. Uh, which was, we can address the world and we can deal with the world as we wish it was, or we can deal with it how it actually is. Uh, and doing the latter is going to leave us much better off, uh, and we might actually accomplish the things we want to. So uh, keep that in mind. You know, we need to aspire to things, but at the end of the day, we need to bring it to where we actually are and figure out how to navigate that space. So that's all I had. Um, I went a little long, but um, if people have questions, I'm happy to, to entertain them. Yep. Um, when I read Robert Caro's book about LBJ, the latest uh, volume, you know, which is about his first two months or seven weeks as president, what was impressive was his capacity, you could call leadership or uh, abusive, abusiveness, whatever, to get things organized. <coughs> As far as I know, there's been no president since who had that capacity, you know, of thing. And I wonder if Obama's problem, one of his problems was he couldn't be tough enough. So, uh, so I actually, I would say it a little differently. Um, I think there are many, many presidents that have gotten a lot done early on. You look at the, the Bush administration, they got those tax cuts through extremely quickly. Like they, when they landed, they knew what they wanted to do and they got it done. Um, this administration, you know, they don't talk about it. This is another source of my frustration. Uh, but in the first term, uh, they passed a stimulus bill. They did uh, finance reform. They did health reform. These are major pieces of legislation uh, that nobody thought was possible. Right? And yet, they don't talk about their accomplishments uh, in quite the same way. And I think it's led people to, to underestimate how much was actually accomplished. Um, I think that's a bigger issue than the, the, the direction. The other thing which is related is if you look at these budget negotiations, and you know, there's been a difficult set, um, the president has gotten a lot of things that you would never have thought would have been possible given the rhetoric that you hear. So, um, and, and he's made a choice, and his people have made a choice, not to crow about those things, but rather just accept them, know that people have confidence that people would recognize it, uh, and then move on. Now, I think that confidence people recognize it was overstated, because I don't think most people didn't understand um, the, the, that the negotiation did yield real benefits from the president's perspective. Uh, but he's been pretty tough. I mean, this episode that we're going through is probably his most visible public toughness. Right? So he's, he's just put it out there. We're not doing this mess anymore. <laughs> um, and I think that's made a lot of uh, people uh, who are disposed to like him, uh, like him more, because it's, it's sort of a, an embodiment of the collective frustration that they all share. Uh, but the thing that, that has impressed me about the president is um, he's calm and he's patient. And those are two things that um, I don't really understand in the context of the world that he lives in. I mean, he lives in a chaotic, high pressure, high tension, high profile environment. And to be calm and to allow sort of the, the noise of the day to go to happen without having that change your perspective is remarkable. And I've, I've never, I've not met many people who have that character to them. Other questions? 
curious about your take on redevelopment, both the federal government's perspective on redevelopment as well as your outlook for redevelopment in California. So redevelopment in California, everyone knows we don't have that anymore, <laughs> right? So, so um, um, you know, I, I don't have the answer for redevelopment. I, I do think that, um, let's say two things on this. One, um, affordable housing and affordability is a huge issue in California, and eventually it will become, if not addressed, a competitive issue for the state and, and what people are willing to do here and what people are willing to come here. Um, the second thing, though, is the first quote, right? And on some level, this is a crisis, and uh, humans have this uh, incredible ability to come up with creative solutions when they're, they're most desperate. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that, that we, will, we will come to that and figure that out. And then I'm going to add one other thing, which is um, I, I do think that um, if you think about the, the, the process by which redevelopment was removed, um, there was a, some strategic errors that were taken by the community development uh, community. Um, they did not really articulate what, their, what the value was. Uh, and what the, what the expectations should have been with redevelopment and its agencies. And that left it vulnerable to a lot of attacks. It's very much of what we were talking about. I think that you know, the next round, we're going to have to think about how do we talk about what effective redevelopment is, what does it look like, and what are the metrics to be able to identify that. Because you know, there are a bunch of those redevelopment agencies that didn't really do much. Right? And you know, if, if we weren't able to to separate the wheat from the chaff, we didn't have a strategy to save the good ones, right? Because they were all lumped together and you know, it was difficult. So we have to think about that. So, yep. Um, so you said when you came in, you saw that there weren't as many subject area experts as you thought they were. Um, is that just, what is that, what was the cause of that? What, is that a relic of just people working there for a long time and not being as in, in touch as they should be? I mean, because people were, keep on saying Washington is out of touch with what's happening. So those are two. Yeah. You should know what's going on. Yeah. So 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 I was you know, make me, you're adding things. Boy, you say the more I want to say. <laughs> right. So so first thing, housing policy um, is broader than HUD, right? And so HUD is really subsidized housing policy if you think about it like that, and that's a relatively small fraction of the broad housing market. Um, nobody in Washington really was thinking about the broad housing market. Fannie and Freddie were doing their thing, and they're churning out profits, and they're not causing any exposure. We get home ownership, homeowners vote. That makes us happy. That was probably as deep as most policymakers in Washington were thinking about housing. Um, so the notion, so, so structurally, we were not set up. There's not a person whose job it is to monitor the broad housing market. There, there just isn't one, right? And most of our housing policy happens through the IRS, the tax code. Uh, we certainly don't have housing people over there. So, so when we think about subject matter experts, I think it is specific to housing in particular and housing's historical role, uh, role here. Um, now, you said something else. Um, oh, Washington being out of touch. Um, so Washington is out of touch, uh, but because they're in Washington, right? And, and when you think about what allows you to get things done. You have to get things done in the context of the institution that you're living in. And Washington's institutions are the Congress and the executive branch. All right, so when you go to Washington, you have to immerse yourself in those processes, in those rules, in those dynamics, and it's a full-time job. All right, when you're working in an office building in Seattle or in San Diego or in Oklahoma City, you are not thinking about those things. You, do, you, you are not sensitive to, to how should things get done. Uh, you just want things to get done, right? And so what you see is all the process. And it's an ugly process, and it's difficult. Um, and then, in, particularly in today's world, we don't even get things done. Uh, but but you, you, it, it is easy for folks in Washington to get completely wrapped up in their stuff and lose touch with um, the stuff that, that is of most importance to the people on the outside. Uh, but it's difficult. I mean, it is very much, the world is how it is, right? And if we want to change things, we, we have to think about changing the rules in Washington. Uh, we need to think about uh, what citizen participation looks like, because 
you know, in today's environment, every congressman goes home on Thursday night, basically. Right? And they're home all weekend long. Now, how many people are they seeing? How many of us are they seeing? Right? And what are we doing to make sure that they know that we're out here uh, and that our perspective is at least as important as those who are giving them funds so they can run their campaigns? Right? We, we have a, a responsibility in this process to, to try to shake it up. Uh, and so we need to think about that. But you know, a politician who works in Washington has got to understand Washington. Right? You, you see um, like Ted Cruz. Right? He gets up and he does all his stuff. Right? He's going to do whatever he does. At the end of the day, how much of what he wanted to get done got done? None of it. Right? And if you look at Mitch McConnell, who people is the backroom dealer, wheeler, all this sort of stuff, he gets his stuff done. Right, his state gets their stuff. You know, if you talk about um, right, Robert Byrd, the, the, the late senator from West Virginia, they built freeways named after him, like multiple. And you go see them, they are, they are beautiful. Right? These are huge things. And these are people who understood the rules of the game and then figured out how to use them to maximum effect. That's what the deal is. Right? And so you can't really do this without being deep in those rules. Um, the question and the challenge is how do you make it feel not as detached from the real world, right, where the rest of us live? And that's, that, that some politicians are very good at it, uh, and many uh, struggle. Right, so, yep. So, do you think the lending and partner institutions should be more under government regulation, especially regarding the subprime lending that caused the crisis? So there's a lot of regulation that's happened uh, already. So Dodd-Frank uh, put in a lot of rules to, to limit what banks can do and to limit the government's uh, willingness to insure bank activity. So there's been a lot already. Uh, that's still being worked out. And so it's an open question as to where we settle. W open question as to if where we settle is where, we, where I think we should settle. I'm, in general, a bit concerned because um, of human nature, right? So th the likelihood for this, the, the strictest, most airtight regulation was going to be right after the crisis. And the further away you get from the crisis, the less, the easier it's going to be just to, oh, it wasn't that bad, oh, we didn't, you know, all these sorts of things. Uh, and the outrage and the concern starts to dissipate. And so we're now, you know, the, the, the peak was 2006. Um, and we had probably three or four years of pain. Um, now we're in the second or third year of not pain. Um, it would be interesting to see sort of uh, to what extent the financial institution lobbies are able to push back and, and weaken some of the things that, that we thought might be important. I mean, I will say, you, you look at the marketplace um, and some of the things that were going on in the 05, 06 period are starting to happen again right, in terms of securitization, in terms of uh, bundling and slicing and dicing of mortgages. Um, so we need to make sure that we're ready. Um, the, 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 the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, um, its existence will make a huge difference uh, because at least now we have an institution whose job it is to look out for these things, right? Out in the open, independent of the safety and soundness issues that are critical. So I think um, it will remain to be seen. I, uh, I'll say this. I'm not convinced that it is possible to regulate away all potential for risk and catastrophe. Right? On some level, we need to be um, moment to moment diligent, uh, and the best protections are an informed consumer in the marketplace. Right? So to me, we, we need to invest a whole lot more to make sure that consumers understand the risks that are inherent in the marketplace and understand their exposures if they take those risks. Uh, and we don't do that very much. We don't do that hardly at all. And um, you know, particularly for housing, which is a huge purchase, is something that we should be uh, thinking about how to do a lot more. Other questions? I just had a quick question about one of your takeaways about the, the implementation process and um, the more need to um, simplify that. And one of the things that we learned from our class is obviously the like, civic engagement or taking consensus building by actually the process of stakeholders. And I remember you talking about how the, uh, the first process, the ham process, it was, uh, I guess, under enrollment or, or not fully utilized. Was there a lot of civic 
and, and then you saw a ramp up with the whole guitar. Is there is that a result of more civic engagement or participation or actually actually working with the city? So, um, so the question is, what's, what's the role of civic engagement on this stuff, right? And did civic engagement sort of make things better or make things worse? You didn't ask that, but I'll, I'll add that on. Uh, uh, there was a lot of civic engagement. I mean, we didn't call it civic engagement. Uh, we called it hearing from constituents and, and parties who are involved in the marketplace. Um, but yeah, we, we heard a lot. Right, you know, there's a lot of me going out and getting yelled at was a form of city civic engagement. You know, you go, you give a speech, and then you take a bunch of questions, and people say you're not doing this, you're not doing that. My aunt got happened, got got hurt this way. You know, my pastor said we shouldn't do. You know, you you start to collect that information. It gives you a flavor of what's working, what's not working, and it gives you a flavor of um, where the focus of policy needs to be, and so that needs to happen a lot. And It's really interesting. It, it, this is very hard information to get, and it's something I, I'm trying to track down. But it'd be interesting to know who, where people travel and who they talk to, because that will shape the type of feedback you get and the type of information you have, and it'll affect the perspective you have. So the White House, so people in the White House don't have travel budgets, right, in general. Right? They're, they're not really able to go around. And so their perspective on the world is really different uh, than for someone like me, who you know we, I get invited to do all these things, and we have grantees that we have to go see and make nice with, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so part of the question and the issue is how does the stuff that I'm hearing um, really get in, incorporated into sort of the broader administration thinking? And that's going to happen in a un, very uneven way. Um, you know, one thing that that is important. And we need to think about this. If there's a question you have on a particular policy issue, who do you talk to? Right? And how do you decide uh, who a credible voice is that is going to represent something useful? In the White House, they are gonna, they're going to pick up the phone and call maybe two people. Right? And we have to hope they pick the right two people um, in doing that. But there is a real issue that we face in terms of who are our, you know, you might think of it like a kitchen cabinet uh, for, uh, for our decision makers and for our leaders. And how, how does that get developed and established and nurtured and modified so that we are sure they're talking to people who actually know enough uh, with enough breadth to, to get something done? So you asked one already, so I want to go. Yep. Um, do you think the gate Engenders distrust with Congress. It seems like sometimes the administration doesn't, you know, reveal information and doesn't seem transparent. So we just get concerned. And then particularly on uh, committees when you have representative from the administration come, it seems like sometimes the information has to get funneled maybe to the OMB or something. It doesn't come directly, and like members get frustrated by that. So, uh, so two things. Uh, one is about gatekeepers, and then one is about transparency. Uh, the gatekeeper thing, everybody knows they're gatekeepers. Right, and in fact, everyone on the Hill is aware of who the other gatekeepers are. That, that is less of an issue. The transparency issue is more difficult. Um, and uh, it, it's difficult in two ways. On one hand, in many instances, what you see in a hearing is grandstanding on both sides. Right? We talk to these people all the time. We know where their offices are concerned about, and we know kind of where all the bodies are. Right, and they do too, right? So, so you don't really need to do all of those things to get some things done. But sometimes you want things on the record. And the way you get things on the record is to invite people to a hearing. You ask them the question that you've talked about for the last 14 months. Uh, they give you the answer that they've given you for the last 14 months. Uh, and then you bang on the desk and move on, right? Uh, um, so, so there's that. There are some instances, though, where um, there are internal conflicts. So you talked about OMB. That's the Office of Management and Budget. That's a White House office, uh, which basically has the authority to, f to, to screen and approve anything that goes out by any agency. Right? So, um, so when we do our regulatory processes, we have to send our proposed regulation to OMB. They have to screen it. They can change it. They can hold it. So we worked on a regulation that they held for eight months. Um, 
uh, and they can change those things. So that can be difficult. And you know, OMB, this is another one of those different perspectives. You know, they're thinking about the world very differently. Um, and so that can be a place where transparency can break down, where you'll want to say things, that, you're not selling people that. Right? You're not, we're not doing this in a public setting. Um, but it's really different from the gatekeeper issue. You had a question? I did. Um, I was wondering if there were, were conversations in amidst the you know, people you worked with about changing the talk about making home ownership a federal priority, because you talked about how it sort of increased, and whether there were concrete programs that were put into place as a result of that. And then sort of related, this might be too long, but I don't, from somebody who hears about rising housing prices on the radio all the time and why that's a good thing, I don't understand why that's a good thing for the average citizen. I understand that's like an economics question, and I don't understand. Economics. Yeah, so so I'm gonna two words. If you can yeah, I'm I'm gonna not say much on that second question. Okay. Um, <laughs> and what was your first question? The first question was about whether there are concrete programs. Oh 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 yeah. So so when we got in, it was clear that home ownership was not really working for everybody. And so what we tried to do is change the narrative around housing policy to say we want a more balanced housing policy. And we had the first ever White House conference on rental housing. Right? So no one ever talked about rental housing in the White House. Um, when you, we changed a, a strategic goal uh, from HUD from increasing home ownership to you know, more balanced housing. Um, and the, you know, the idea is that you know, the way I describe it, we need to get people housed well rather than get them to be homeowners. Those are not necessarily the same thing. And we need to uh, help people understand uh, what it looks like to be housed well. And, and so that, that's the task. And it's, you know, after 100 years of home ownership, first, foremost, and only, uh, getting that message out to have it be um, organic is difficult. Right, it'll take some time. I, I do think that the experience has led people to, to understand that there is more risk to home ownership than we'd actually talked about. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, and so, so we'll see. But there's definitely more balance. And you have not heard the president say, I want to increase home ownership. And you're not going to hear him say it. Um, and that's a direct, uh, he'll, he will break the chain. Uh, that we've had for, for quite a while, and I think in a fairly important and positive way. Um, rising house prices is a good thing. Um, probably not 20% year over year. That may be more than, than is a good thing. Uh, but to the extent that housing for most families is a form of forced savings and a long run source of sustained wealth, uh, we need that asset to perform in a stable and secure way to, so that we know that, that it's, a, it's appreciating, right? And so, um, so that, that's the, the, the vehicle, right? So the, but for, for most of the history of the United States, uh, owning a home was the way to have retirement money, right? That that was going to be your, your end, of the, end of life nest egg. And um, only recently did we start using it as an ATM. Uh, and that led to a whole host of differences in terms of how people think about housing, uh, what House price changes mean and the opportunities they represent. Okay. I have the unenviable task of cutting off a very, very good discussion. Uh, but we have reached 1.30. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Rafael Bostic. Uh, two weeks from today, we do have uh, Shivani Saroya, who will talk to us about financial instruments in developing countries. She's the CEO of her own firm. The week after that, Deputy Mayor Rick Cole. Uh, so I invite you to keep your eye out for both of those. One last round of applause.